Pentecostal Research Center in Cleveland, Tennessee, located on the campus of Lee College in the Church of God School of Theology. It's July 31, 1991, and I'm very privileged today to have a friend of mine visit with me for a conversation, Dr. Goodwin Smith, who is superintendent of the Church of God in Bermuda, a man of great experience and ability, a man of considerable uh, renown uh, in many parts of the Church of God. Uh, Brother Smith, it's just really good to have you to come by and to uh, uh, visit uh, with me for a while this morning. Did you come straight from Bermuda here? Yes, first, uh, Dr. Conrad, it's also a real pleasure and a privilege for me to even be invited to be here. And I've always respected you. And my wife and I did come in right from our uh, island convention, our 45th island convention in Bermuda. And we arrived here late last evening, and uh, she's with me. You, you just came in uh, last evening? Yes. So. Also, let me tell you this, that uh, since you were last in Bermuda also, we just had our second uh, granddaughter born six days ago. Oh. My, my daughter gave uh, birth to another daughter, so we have two grandchildren now, so I think I need to tell you that also. Well, thank you for sharing that with me. I met her. Yes, you did. We yes, you did. <laughs> a very lovely uh, lady. And uh, Sister Smith is with you also. Yes, she is. Mm -hmm. Well, good. We'll look forward to having some time together yeah. while yeah. you're visiting here. Uh, Brother Smith, you uh, have several distinctions in the Church of God. You were a member of the very first uh, Council of 18 in the uh, Church. When the Council of 12 was changed to a Council of 18, you were one of those elected to it. And that was a, a tremendous milestone for you. Also, you were able to bring onto the uh, council so many insights and so many uh, perspectives that the church had not been privileged to have before. And you have also uh, been honored in your, uh, in your colony, and you've been honored uh, even in the empire, uh, the British empire. So we think that uh, you are a man God has touched in this very special way for this time and to do a, a work for him. But I'd like to know a little bit about you. Where, where do you really come from and how did you get from where you started to where you are now? Brother Khan, um, I'm a Bermudian. My parents and all of my family born in Bermuda. Um, my mother died um, very young age, I would say. She was 54 when she died, and she died some 20 years ago. Um, my father's still living. He's a member of my council at our church. Earlier, when we were little kids, we were brought up in the Pentecostal faith. Uh, that was the United Holiness Church. It's a very small movement. I think they have their headquarters in somewhere in Carolina. As I grew older, then I moved away from that and went out and did everything, I guess, that any young man would do in the world. I've been in the sport world, played cricket, um, and that's an English game. Mm -hmm. um, we played cricket, we've uh, refereed in the football, regular league games there. And we've had our share, I guess, of everything that the world could present to, to one young man. Then in later years, um, we felt um, just a spiritual uh, a revival or, or rejuvenation, I think we wanted in our lives, with no real commitment, um, and I joined the AME. I guess one of the reasons why I joined the AME was because of what they stood for. They were this African Methodist Ep Episcopal, and they started through some racial situation where they were not accepted in the uh, Methodist Church, and Richard Allen, who was the founder, then decided to move from the Methodist and started the African Methodist Episcopal. Now, pardon me, <coughs> uh, are you talking about this um, discord? Was that in Bermuda or was that in America? Th that was in America. That's, that's in America. what I thought. Yes, it was that was in here America. In the States, right. Then. And when the church came to Bermuda in the uh, early 1900s, I think it was, might have, it might have been longer than that. Yes, it's been longer than that, probably in the 18th. Um, I, I sort of wanted to align myself with them. 
But after becoming a part of the, the EME and uh, basically working with the youth, um, there was still a void. There was still something that I was searching for. And um, I always felt that I would go back to my Pentecostal roots. It was something that was, I guess, embedded in me. And um, so as, a, as I got older, uh, and still not fully committed to any, any uh, religious or, or any church organization, I guess later on I, I was looking for a young lady to be a part of my life mm -hmm. and, and I just went around and I happened to find a young lady that, well I was interested in, in the Anglican church. And um, I went and joined that church and, and, and thought that something would happen there. Uh, got confirmed in the Anglican church, still didn't work. And um, I just gradually just laid for it and went along and did my thing early part of my life. Um, and then finally, I met my present wife, who was a Sunday school teacher in the Anglican Church, and happens to be the cathedral in Bermuda, the, the, the biggest church in Bermuda, Anglican Church. And I'm still persuaded to the Pentecostal. It's still in my blood. Mm -hmm. And uh, I just felt like if I had to have a wife, my wife's going to have to be of that persuasion. But when I met my wife and really loved her, and she loved me, and we were there in courting, I'm uh, wondering how could I get this girl to come from, uh, from Anglican mm -hmm. to Pentecostal. Well, in 1963, she was the one that made the first to move. She went into, we heard a radio broadcast with the Church of God, uh, with the headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee. Reverend Fubler was the pastor there, and he was in the island. And we started to visit his church, and we liked what we heard, we liked what we saw. And we were going for, I guess, a good year or so. I guess three months after she had accepted Christ, I accepted him. And then I was very interested in what this church believes in. When I looked at the doctrines, they... Now this they, was your first introduction to the Church of God. My first introduction to the Church of God. I've been through these others, and that's yes. why I, I thought <coughs> I would make that known to you. And out of all of the churches that I had uh, visited and frequent, um, I liked what the Church of God had. The other thing I'd always determined, that I would not be in a church that had all men. I didn't want to be in a church that was all black. I didn't want to be in a church that was all women. And uh, when I saw this church and saw the makeup, I said, this is my thing, and especially what this church stood for. I asked Pastor Fubler to give me a minute book before I was a member. And I went home and studied that minute book, scripture by scripture, every belief of the church. And when I had digested that thing, I said, there's no other church this side of heaven that's got what this church has. And without any hesitation, I became a member of the church. And then uh, immediately I said to the pastor, I wanted to do something to help. Now, pardon me, let's get, get a date peg here. Okay. Uh, but with what year are we talking about? When? We're talking about 1963. This is 1963. 1963. I was converted on the 17th of March, 1963. And... Uh, um, going on and on and I immediately, I was very very busy in the world, doing a bit of everything mm -hmm. as I've already explained in the sport world, um, doing things there. So when I came to the church and had, had genuinely accepted Christ in my life, I wanted everything that Christ had for me. And I guess you can appreciate when you're just newly something new, you want everything. Mm -hmm. And so I sought for the baptism of the Holy Ghost, which I believed in, I, t I, was, I, I studied and saw this was for me. and. Um, Sure enough, God baptized me, and um, then I wanted to do work for the Lord. I went to the pastor. I said, anywhere you could use me, then I'm available. And so I became um, Sunday school superintendent eventually, Sunday school superintendent. But before that, I was assistant superintendent. I was a Sunday school teacher. And then I saw a real need of um, our people being studied, uh, uh, being, I'm sorry, they needed to know more about the Word of God. We, we have a tendency to sit and listen to what the preacher has to say, but we don't study for ourselves. And, and because of that, I said to the pastor, there was no real activity going on in our church. There was no real Bible class, no more than what you had on a Sunday morning during Sunday school. So I said to him, can I have a Bible class? I feel led of God to teach people. I said, I've done some study myself. And I did that for one year. He, he allowed me and did it for one year. And the enthusiasm from our membership was, was fantastic. So then I saw a need for me to further my theological studies. So I then left Bermuda 
1968. But just before that, I had gotten my first exhorters certificate from the Church of God in 1967. Mm -hmm. And um, and so I'm, I'm giving you most of this in a nutshell, I suppose. Um, and, and then from there, I felt a very definite need in my life to further my um, academic studies plus my theological. I just want to know all I could about God's Word so I can teach our people. And so I left Bermuda in 1967, right after 1968, and at the meantime also uh, to leave Bermuda to come to the United States is not easy. Mm -hmm going through immigration, what have you. And I did not want to leave Bermuda without my family. I've seen too many families broken because of that. The father going one place and the wife is left home looking but after that children. That is always a dangerous thing. Yes. And I only had the one child, and I suppose that helped me a lot. The, uh, Reverend, at um, um, that time in the New York State, um, he was the overseer, poor his name just, the, just passes by me right now. Um, but anyhow, Harris, R. D. Harris, was there. And he was in Bermuda during that time during during our convention. And I spoke to him about my need of going to Bible school. And at that time I had already been accepted to enter the Manhattan Bible Institute. Um, so with that, there had to be some way that I had to be linked with the church to get out of the island. And what was happening, he needed a pastor in the States. I was then an exhorter. And uh, asked me what I consider pastoring. I said, well, that's far from, from even in my mind. I, I just want to study, go, come back home and help the church there. So with that, we did go through um, working out papers and everything. There was a church available at uh, 105 on 117th Street, right in Harlem. And I said, okay, I'll take that. That was an easy a way out for me to get out of Bermuda. And that, with that, they would also allow my wife and daughter to, to travel with me. And that's what happened. So we came out of Bermuda in 68, and uh, we passed at 105. At the same time, I was going to Bible school, and um, the, 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 the strain of both, I guess, and I was doing secular work, because the church was very small, was in a very bad area, tough, rough you area. You were in Harlem. I was right in the heart of Harlem. Mm -hmm. I mean, in the midst of Howell, leaving Bermuda, which we call paradise, yes. uh, and coming there, in fact, Many people, my mother-in-law and others of our, our family, wanted to know whether I had flipped it. I had <laughs> gone crazy to take uh, my family and leave Bermuda and go to, to New York. To go to Harlem. To enter New Harlem. York. Yeah. But Dr. Khan, I guess if there was ever a place that we felt so at peace and, and so comfortable, I was there. We, we were, we were I, I was first being fulfilled. And then we were meeting the needs of, of a congregation that had literally been left there to die, a spiritual death. And going to Bible school, I was being sharpened daily going to Bible school. Uh, Dr. Boyce, um, he's the, he was the president of the Manhattan Bible Institute, who then suggested that I should go on further, and I, again, I'm going a little ahead of myself, to further, I had gone in ba um, basic Bible studies, uh, no, learning pardon me, what was the name of the school? The Manhattan Bible Institute. Mm -hmm. And so with that, it suggested that I would um, further uh, and go for a doctorate. He felt that I had the ability, and I said, well, how do I, I haven't come for all of that. I just, I just needed to get some knowledge of God's Word that I may direct our people the right way. So with that, and, and uh, through all of that, then finally, I guess, uh, again, to, to make it short, is that I did receive my doctorate in 1973. So we, we went on and we pastored a church and, and, and I enjoyed pastoring the church. In the process, I had been, uh, church had been broken in a uh, hundred times um, and we had a very little things in the church afterwards. It, uh, Was again, it uh, vandalism or? Vandalism, yeah. they, they, they came in basically to look for whatever they could steal to sell for drugs. Oh, yeah. I was in a drug area. Dr. Khan, I walked to church and literally found a body laying on my step, dead, mm. and um, had to call the police. And I mean, he didn't just die, he was beaten. Um, I had been beaten myself um, uh, at one time uh, and, t and kept for about three hours um, outside of Kennedy Airport. And I was kept for some three hours um, and the guys would not let me go. Were and these they, thugs? Or? Yeah, they were young men who had basically stole a car who hit broadside my car 
and um, with their stolen car. with their stolen car. No police arrived. It, 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 was, it was just strange. It was just strange for me coming from Bermuda. But I finally got away from him. I had to actually run away from him. And that was after their attention was drawn to something else. And I ran away from them. And, and finally, I got away. The, the uh, situation in New York uh, became very serious to me. And, and I really found that God's going to have to really protect me for what was going down. I had been threatened by a young man uh, that he was going to kill me, and sure enough, he came in the church tonight with that night with a knife in his hand. Again, this was all basically, you may wonder why this, the other one was because of the accident and the young man had stole the car. The situation in the church was that our church was in a little storefront situation that was owned by the Church of God. But this blew my mind because when I went through New York City and saw the type of of uh, pulled down, disgusting buildings that the Church of God was having. Mm -hmm. I said, no wonder the congregations only had 15 people in them. Mm -hmm. And that instilled in me some fire, mm -hmm. fire to, to start a campaign, a crusade of uh, the Church of God ministers, and, and, and primarily black ministers, to let's, let's sort of rise above this storefront situation. Let's, Let's get some buildings. And if we could get just one good building in New York City for blacks, not necessarily for blacks, but no, uh, that's totally where our congregation, blacks, yes, yes. A good black congregation that, see the Baptists, we, we, we were fighting people like Adam Clayton Powell at that time at the Abyssinian Baptist Church. And we can go on to all the, the, the other Antioch Baptist Church and the Pentecostal churches that were all in that area. But they were statues that were standing tall and high in the area and saying, here we are. But there was no church of God, no more than a little storefront. Dr. Khan, in the church that I pastored, in the basement, um, when the, we had a heater, a water heater, and, and, and heat our building, um, sometimes that would flood. The water would come up because New York City being an, an island, Water would come up out of the ground, would just come up under the building. And I'd walk downstairs and find water, not exaggerating, two to three feet high, that would go in our boiler and destroy it. And, and, and there has been times that I've gone down and I thought it was a cat, it was actually a rat swimming in the water and met me and my deacon coming down a dark steps and frightened me because it hit my leg and hit his. And we thought it was a cat. It was a rat, and I, and, and I, I'm size. sure the thing was, oh, it was, if it was not 12 inches, it was not anything at all. It was a long thing. I fought that roaches. I was in a very bad area, and, and if you, and, and you do know where I, I, I come from in Bermuda, my culture was different than that. That's not the type of thing that we were brought and up you, in. And your personal background was considerably different. Was completely, that, yes. yes, different. So be, under that, coming up under that and seeing that, I said, these people deserve more than this. This is God's people. But outside of that, I wanted to give God a church. Mm -hmm. Even though I know God is not all, that, well, not all that concerned, but about the materialistic thing. We want to give God a building that we can be proud of and, and where we can attract people. So along with that, um, the building had apartments above it. And in these apartments were people who did not pay rent. When I first got in New York City, the church was in a very bad financial state, which I found many of our black churches are. And I'm saying this because there are some things that I'll say later to understand where I'm coming from mm -hmm. and where my conviction is. And, and, and so with the, the financial, the lack of financial uh, administration in, in the black church, um, this upset me tremendously. But I'm not one to stand on the sidewalk and point fingers and talk about it. I'm one to do something about it. So with that, the tenants upstairs um, were old people. And uh, I had gotten uh, letters from Cleveland, Tennessee, uh, from the uh, um, loan department or whatever you, and I, I mean, they were, not, they were not nice letters. They were letters just saying, you've got to pay this money. And I had just gotten there as a new, just a new pastor, just a young fellow, mm -hmm. not even, <laughs> I, I didn't realize what I was getting into. And I tried my best, and we raised some money, we sent it to Cleveland, Tennessee. Then the city started writing letters um, of, of tax that hadn't been paid and, and all other things that mm -hmm. you pay in America. And then, we had, then what Sister Smith and I did, we started to write home. 
to some of our friends to send us money. And you'll be surprised the thousands of dollars that we got back from Bermuda and paid into some of the, the, the uh, problems that I had pastor in that church. Now, I, I'll, I'll come back to that. So when I had to deal with the tenants upstairs, I decided that I need to move out these tenants. I need to do something about, about this building. I need to get out of this building. So with doing this, one of the ladies, which was an old lady, her grandson was in prison. Apparently he came out of prison and found a letter from me stating that I'm going to ask them to leave the church. But whenever they can, no, there was no pressure, no time set for them to leave. And his grandmother and I got on real fine. And um, we had, a, uh, had some words on the telephone, and they were very strong words from him and I. So he threatened me. And he said, I'll be there tonight to, um, I've got something for you. He, he, whatever he said made me know that he's going to try to do something. Whether he's going to shoot me, what I don't know. So that, after I got off the phone, my wife said to me, he said, what's wrong? I said, well, it's nothing that me and God can't handle. And I didn't want to tell her. We always took our little daughter with us to church. She's just about two years then. And that night I said to her, I said, honey, leave gay home. I said, in fact, why don't you stay home with her? I really felt that I may not ever come back. And, uh, but I never wanted to tell her what went on. She said, no, it's something different, something serious, and I'm going to go. I said, if I tell you what it is, then would you stay with gay? She said, no, if it involves you, then I want to be with you. Mm, right. So we left the daughter home and she drove with me. And Dr. Khan, every night that I went in Harlem, there was a parking space in front of my church where I could just park the car, run up the steps and get inside. I'm talking about our church being in a literal hell. Drugs were sold in that street, prostitution, you name it. Um, and with that, she went with me. All the way over, I never talked. I lived in Long Island, so it's about an hour drive. And driving over, she never, I never talked and she didn't say anything because she knows me. And she knew I was upset, and at least I was running in my mind whatever was going on. Mm -hmm. And when I got there, there was no parking space, so I dropped her off. I said, you go in. And I could not get a parking space until I had gone about three quarters of the block. Now, to park there and walk down, knowing that a guy has already threatened me, I'm putting myself in a real bad situation. Uh, you were I, in jeopardy. Uh, I, I definitely was, yes. definitely. I had preached the Sunday before about our people buying things off of paddlers, that the paddlers have stolen. They've stolen from some store, they've stolen from somebody else. So don't buy things from paddlers. I want to show you the significance of that. And uh, that night when I parked my car up this block, by the time I was just about to turn my key off and I looked, I saw a pair of legs standing by my car window. I didn't know who those legs belonged to. In fact, I didn't know Mrs. Simmons, who was a lady upstairs. I didn't know her grandson, because he had always been in prison. And something told me, this is the guy that's out to get me. I was afraid to get out of the car, yet my wife now is set. I was just digging holes for myself. My wife was down in, at the church, so I said, well, I've got to get her. And I prayed a little prayer, said, God, you're going to have to protect me. And I'm going to confront whoever this is outside of my door. And when I opened the door, he stepped back. And when I did, he said, Reverend, um, I've got some nice suits for you to buy, some nice dresses for the lady. Here was a peddler, guy who had sterling suits and everything, coming to me. Now, I just preached on the Sunday. This was like the Wednesday night now. On the Sunday, I preached against this thing. And here's this guy coming now. said it. First time it had ever happened to me for any peddler to want to sell me. And immediately, I was about, I was so happy, Dr. Cotton, because this is not the guy that threatened me on the phone. So I was so happy about it. I was going to buy the whole thing from the guy. And immediately the Spirit checked me of the message I preached Sunday. So I told him, I said, no, listen, I don't, I, I don't want to buy it, but I'll tell you what. If you need $10, I said, I'll give you $10. And I just gave him $10 and walked away. And I felt so good about that that I had gotten away from him. And gradually I got down the street and got to my church without any problem. When I got into church, we had the service moving. God was moving in a, in a miraculous way. I'm talking about maybe 31 people. I'm not talking about a crowd. 31 people. We were having a great time in the Lord. And God was moving. I was in the pulpit getting ready to teach. I taught on, on, Tuesday, on Wednesday nights. And the people were just there praising God at the eyes closed and hands lifted and 
praising and glorifying God, and here comes this guy in. He was a fair-skinned, ginger-headed guy. I'd never seen him before. And in his hand, he had, I'm sure, about 14-inch blade, and I saw it shining. And I could see, I mean, I could see the evil. He was vicious in his eyes. And the spirit said, this is him. I mean, I knew it was the guy. Never had seen him before. But if you knew Mrs. Simmons, she was a dark lady. You could never put her with this guy. He was fair-skinned and ginger-headed. Couldn't, I couldn't put him with her, but I knew it was him. And he came up the aisle. And he walked up the aisle. I mean, he came up there after me. And just when he got about he three quarters, he didn't sit down and wait or didn't know he just walk in the church through. to do what he came to do. And he had to be led by demons because I saw it on his face. And I knew that I was in for a tough time, but I also knew that I was wrapped up in God. But when you're faced with something like that, it, 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 boy, it really does something to you. But I've never seen God move like he did. And, and I don't know what would have happened if he didn't do that. Mm -hmm. um, just when he got about three quarters way up, I would say about three seats, benches, from getting toward me, the people were still praising God because they didn't see him. It was only he and I. And um, the people just start, was in, in the process, they were praising God anyhow. They would start to speak in tongues and walking out in the aisle, just, just speaking in tongues and just you know, falling out in the aisle. And when they did this, he stopped in his steps. I mean, as fast as he got there, that's as fast as he stopped. And when he stopped, I'm talking about people who never saw him, who never touched him. They were just, they were women, they were men, they were just praising God, eyes closed, tears, and they were speaking in tongues. And he stood there like this doctor, and he, he looked around, he looked around in amazement, dropped that knife, and ran out of that church like I've never seen a guy run. Mm. I've never seen mm. him since. Of all the... And when, when I talked to Mrs. Simmons, she said to me, he said, yes, that was my, that was my, I expl you know, uh, mm -hmm. identify. She said, yes, that, that was my grandson. So that, and that's when I saw the power of God. So I got real strong in New York after that. I said, God is on our side. So that was one of the, the areas. Now going back to, to what I said earlier about we needed to, I needed to get my people out of that, th that building and that church and that type of environment. We did not do it without an evangelistic thrust, just in that block. And what we did is, is we asked the police department, we got the okay from the city, to cordon off that whole block. And one Saturday morning, a Saturday was the worst time in the world going that street. It is tough. I mean, you get the drugs, dealers, the pushers, everybody's there. They're all there. With Prostitute. I'm talking about broad daylight. I went to the city and got, this, got a, 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 a permit to close the city off, cordon it off. And they came, they cordoned off the city, they put the, um, what we call horses across the street, mm. cordoned it off. And, um, uh, you know, you can see the dealers coming in, trying to get in, couldn't get in, in the street because it was blocked off. Some people came and they moved them, you know, they came through anyhow. Mm. But we put our pulpit in the middle of the street, in that, right in that, uh, on that street, on the 17th street. And all of our people were out, and I'm not talking about a lot of people. I then had, uh, my congregation going up to around 75. And, but they were all there, the kids, everything. I had my daughter and everybody. And we had a young man who had been in drugs. God had changed his life to preach. While he was preaching, a demon-possessed lady walks out with half naked. Um, she was more naked. She was probably three-quarters naked walked up and walked in front of him and did a snake dance and blew smoke in his face and tried to kiss him and he just kept on pre preaching and did his thing. And um, there were jeers at us and there were a lot of things going on against us in the church. And then we closed that down and we walked in every apartment on that street. There's no elevators. The halls are filthy, rats, roaches. Mm -hmm. I'm talking about stairs, and they went eight stories high. We had teams for each area. We had a, my wife had a team, and I think that was probably a mistake I made, at least after I thought about it, because I put her in a real precarious position. I had a team, she had a team, and it's my deacons had team, some of my ministers had team, and we went all this year, it's not going to do us, and telling the folk about the Church of God and about Jesus Christ. My wife was accosted by a young man with a knife to her throat in one of the hallways and only God brought her out of that. Mm. Again, to move on further, one night we were leaving the service. My wife, where she was sitting on her side and had my little girl in her lap, all we heard was a 
of just a loud noise like that. And we, I mean, very loud. And we didn't know what it was. She, she said, what is that? I said, what? We didn't know. And all of a sudden, I saw my windshield just, just, just shattering. Mm -hmm. And right where she was sitting, there was a bullet hole. Oh. The bullet did not penetrate, but the hole was in the windshield, and the whole windshield shattered. And had it penetrated, it would have killed her instantly, because it was going right straight for her. Mm. And my daughter. I've seen all of those things going down, <coughs> but God had, has bought, had bought Smith and I out of that. So with that, I had a, a very strong desire, well before that, that the Church of God needs to send a message in the city. And I think the enemy knew that, and that's why I had been confronted so much by him. There was a cat burglar in the building we lived in, and I heard him when he jumped. He had been in all these apartments upstairs, which I didn't know then, but I was laying in bed about 1, 2 o'clock in the morning, might have been 3, and I heard this jump outside of my bedroom window. And I, 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 I sleep very light, and immediately well, you know, This is up. on Long Island. This is on Long Island. But I want to show you where the devil, seemingly, he was after Goodwin Smith, because of what I think I wanted to do for the church. Um, and I immediately went to my, my uh, Venetian blinds, looked at it, and I saw this guy stooping down, but he was walking toward the bedroom where my little girl was. And sure enough, when I got out, when I left there, and ran around, and I go through a living room area and a little dining area to get to my daughter's bedroom, sure enough, he was there trying to open up the little area where you have for your air conditioning to set in, mm -hmm. but she didn't have an air condition. He had gotten one part of it down. He had gotten the outside down. And he was, he was trying to get the inside, which was no problem, because all he had to do was push it. That would have come through. And, it would out. and um, I was waiting there for him. I was waiting there for him. And um, I was going to do him in. I had a little something that I was going to do him in. Mm -hmm. But I prayed. I said, God, if this man comes in here, I'm going to be a murderer tonight. And God, I'm not a murderer. I'm a child of you. And I said, God, you're going to have to deliver. And just by that time, I had all of this noise coming down the hall. We were on the first floor, um, which was above the garage. So that's where he was. He was on top of the garage. And with all these no this noise, they were knocking on my door. I was trying to get this guy. And at the same time, right side of my apartment was an exit that got out on the top of the garage. So I heard all of this noise, and apparently it was them. I later found out. Well, that was the thing that scared him off. So I still believe God was in that, mm -hmm. security more. So I went outside and they said to me, Reverend Smith, have you heard? I said, yes. Um, the guy just left my window. They ran around, that's when we saw the thing kicked out and him trying to get in my apartment. Well, he had been in eight apartments. He had literally gone in the apartments. The people were there. He sprayed some type of um, mechanical stuff that, that put the people to sleep. Uh, one lady said she saw him. He went through her husband's pants, his wallet, and everything, took out everything. She said she saw him, but they, they were just there like this, hanged. They couldn't move. So he'd done that in all the apartments. So he had still watches, he got jewelry, he got money, he got everything. So my apartment was the last one, but he never got into it. Uh, so those were some of the experiences that I faced in New York, but determined that I was going to stay there in that wicked city. That changes now from those things that were happening from without I felt that there had to be something done within, and that was that the Church of God needs to send a message in this city that we're here, and we're alive, and we're well. So I called a meeting of the black ministers in the Church of God to, to and, and, and I never expect that my superiors do this for me, meaning uh, I thought it was a problem that we had at blacks and let us deal with it. And Brother Con, I guess that is a cardinal sin you know, I, I, and in fact, I'm learning that more even this very day, that you don't do that. That's cardinal sin in, in the church, that you don't rally around your people. Uh, you do it the way that the, the, um, your superiors say do it. And if Cleveland, if Cleveland, Tennessee is not behind it, then you don't do it. I was very much convicted with and convinced that that's what I needed to do because I was in a, a city and I had dealt with some things and seen some things in New York that um, it didn't want me to come to Cleveland and talk about it. I had to deal with it in New York. When I did that and called a meeting, it was divisive. That's the type of reports that I'm dividing. And, and that was, God knows, up to the day, that was never my intention. Um, I was trying to rally around our people to, let's 
develop some pride within ourselves as a race of people. Uh, let's get better buildings. If we can even come together and get one building, let's get it. And it, 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 was, just, it, was, well, it was very frustrating for me until finally I decided that I would not, I could see what was happening more. I said, back off from it, and I did. So I became a loner. Loner meaning, let me go and deal with my own immediate congregation. Um, during that time, Dr. Horton was the general overseer, and uh, in talking with him, or, or with the overseer of the state there, and who was J.D. Goulden, and I'm going a pass a little bit because uh, in, the, in those other years, um, also, I received my license while I was in New York. As you know, I went there mm. as a, a, an, an exhorter, which I got him in 1967, went to the States in 68. In 1971, I received my license. In 1972, I was ordained. I was ordained under the overseership of New York. Manuel Campbell mm -hmm. was my overseer. And then um, J.D. Golden came into New York. And when J.D. D came in, it was during that time that I was wanting to get some physical buildings for the Church of God. It was during that time that I met up against the opposition, and, and that was within our own ranks, meaning among our black brethren. So some of the blacks were Oh, oh uh, more also. so. I think that they were the ones that probably said to uh, superiors in Cleveland that watch out for Goodwin Smith because he's trying to do this and do that, and that was not it. Mm -hmm. And it had always been interpreted that I was, I was doing it for South Gain, or at least uh, somewhere where Goodwin was going to get some credit. That was not it. So I said later for that, after I saw that, my wife told me to back off. I then proceeded to seek for my immediate congregation. Mm -hmm. I went through that city and had my deacons with me, and we looked for buildings, and we found a lot of pulled down buildings in a lot of pulled down destroyed areas. But Dr. Khan, we found a beautiful Jewish synagogue um, about three blocks from where Dr. Ike is, and it's there today, doing doing a big work, not a great work. I don't believe he's doing a great work. I think he's doing a big work. Um, but I think that he's also, um, um, I don't even know the word to use, uh, to the people in that area. He's so, become kind of a symbol. He's a well, he, 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 I just think that he's, he's um, leading the people down the wrong path. Clearly that, yes. And, and so with that, the Church of God had a good opportunity, and I was going to fight him. I would fight him. And, um, um, and I'm talking about in the Word. I'm not talking about a I physical understand. fight. I'm just talking about the Word of God and, and where, this, where it's all at. And there was this beautiful synagogue, the ideal thing, and I wanted a, I wanted a senior citizen thing. I wanted a, a daycare center. That has been one of the desires. I wanted to make um, open up areas for our senior citizens in our church somewhat like the North Cleveland situation you have here, found this building, which was about 110 to $120,000. We're talking back in uh, the early 70s. Um, then a few other ministers in the New York area got, I guess, the itch that they wanted a building too. And so we had uh, 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 Brother Jacques, Honoré Jacques, he's the Haitian leader there. He needed building. His church was just breaking out at the seams with the amount of Haitians that were coming to the United States. Then Brother Notice, Guy Notice, mm -hmm. wanted um, a Jamaican church, mm -hmm. and it went on and on. So everybody now wanted to want a church because Brother Horton, if I can remember, was coming to New York to, to primarily look at, look at these buildings that we had gotten. And um, anyhow, they looked at the buildings. They looked at mine. They looked at all the buildings. But yet it seemed like it had, uh, had been a foregone conclusion, I mean, that was before they got there, that they were not buying my one. I mean, that's bottom line. They bought a, a laundromat, a, a laundromat, and they converted it into a church. I'm talking about a laundromat that had the sides with the wall about 24 inches high with the, all of the uh, laundry uh, machines to it with the pipes and everything. Yeah, they all bought the, all that the connections are still there. They bought that. They bought a little house, mm -hmm. uh, and they went turned it into a little church. The very things that I was trying to get away from, this is what this church came to New York City and bought. I had a brick building. I still got the picture home in Bermuda, and every time I open up my album and look at it, I weep. 
And that brick church that had pews in it, a huge church. And mind you, I only had 70 some members. So my members would have looked like a little handful in this building. But I, uh, my challenge was to fill every pew with Church of God people, members. And I think we would have done that. The area then, was, which was Jewish at one time, was becoming um, Hispanic and blacks. And I felt that we had a real good thing going and that the church could even eventually be used in a double way where we could use it for Hispanics during uh, early service and blacks later, and, you know, just a multi-type thing. Well, anyhow, that was my, my whole dream and vision was, was short-lived because they did not purchase it. I was very much hurt, and, and, and um, I, was, I was basically wounded, really wounded. Now, to backtrack a little bit, I had been appointed at one time to pastor a huge church up in Rochester, New York, that was pastored by Brother Richard at, a, at the camp meeting in New York. I remember Brother Hughes was the speaker there. Uh, I turned that down, not just to turn down, but I thought that if there was a people that needed Goodwin Smith, and I think that I just needed to be there. I was in New York, down in that little church. In fact, my people um, rose up against it. They, they wrote letters to the overseer that don't move this man. Every time we got a good man, you move him. So my wife and I stayed there. I'm talking about doing secular work. Both of us going to school, and we stayed there. And I was going to a church that was going to give me everything that I wanted for the church in New York. I'm talking about a daycare center, a senior citizen program, you name it. Um, so I stayed there. When all of this other thing did not materialize about the building, purchasing of the building, I then got a call to come back to Bermuda. And it was very easy for me to accept it. I did not want to go back to Bermuda. I'd been in the States then from 68 to 74. Um, that was six I, years. You yeah, think. six years. I did not want to go back to Bermuda. We, in fact, we were about, my wife and I were about ready to buy our own home right in Long Island. In fact, we were talking, we, we were about ready to close the deal when I got a call about coming back home. The only reason why I went back now to you Bermuda... you still were before, Bermudian. You had still not Bermudian. changed your citizenship. No. Um, and I did not take out American. I had been mm -hmm. asked by, you know, the authorities here to do so after five years. Um, we didn't do that. We went back to Bermuda, not really wanting to go, but we thought, well, if this is what the Lord wanted to do, get me out of my frustration. Uh -huh. That's where we are. So I've been back in Bermuda now 17 years. You, you went back in 1974. From the 74 uh, assembly, I went back basically as the overseer of the island, and also I pastored, I pastored now the headquarters church in the island. But that's this side of my... Well, uh, let, let's uh, look at that a moment. Have you been back to New York? Have you visited any of those churches since you returned to Bermuda? Okay, since that time, uh, the Church of God did purchase Woody Crest, which is up by Yankee Stadium, uh, for the congregation that I passed in. I had determined that the hindrance to the, to the purchase of a building in New York was Goodwin Smith. I determined that somewhere along the line, my credibility in this church had been tarnished by whom I don't know. I believe basically from some of my black brethren who told stories, stories that were believed by my superiors mm -hmm. without anybody even checking me out. So I never caused any ripples in the water. I found the best thing for me is to back off the stage, love God, mm -hmm. remain in the Church of God, keep my nose clean, mm -hmm. and, and do what I had to do. And that's one of the reasons. So immediately, when we left, I wouldn't say immediately, but they placed a man in, in, in the church right after me, and I felt that he'll get it for you, he'll get the bill, and they'll listen to him, which was, was Charles Marcel, fine mm -hmm. yeah. guy. He, I married him, and he married my church clerk, and I was the one to perform the ceremony. Um, and in about a year or so, sure enough, they found this building up in Woodycrest, and without any hesitation, it was bought. Um, and that's no problem. It didn't have to be bought through Goodwin Smith. I just pleased to see that congregation mm -hmm. move out of that area and now they're relocated. And it's a real nice building. Yes, I've been back there. Um, they had an anniversary the other day, and I was the guest speaker. I'm talking about a few years now. I was the guest speaker. I still receive 
telephone calls, letters from the membership there. And um, so my uh, rapport, relationship with them uh, there at the church has always been A1. Mm. So we went back to Bermuda. And then, well, before we leave okay. New York again, uh, what about this um, racial mix there? You mentioned Hispanics that were there. You mentioned Haitians. Yeah. You are a Bermudian. I presume that most of the people of your congregation were American blacks. Well, let me answer that. I had, and that I think, and I'm I'm so glad that you said that. And, and it sounds to me like you understand some of the frustration that we as blacks face. And I think that many of our whites don't understand that. I think when you see a group of black people together, you say, "There they are, black folk." Man, there's more problems among us than you can shake a stick at. And I mean that because you do have various cultures. You've got You've got the black American, but you've got a black Northern, Northern American. You've got the black, black Southern American, American. You've got the black American who come from way out west, you know. Mm -hmm. And then you've got, in the blacks, you've got me, a Bermudian, whose culture is different from any of those I've just mentioned, and who is also different culture from those in the Caribbean. And my culture in Bermuda is different from the Jamaican. So I had Jamaicans in my congregation. I had, um, of folk from uh, Barbados and my culture, different again, um, Trinidadians. Um, there's friction between Trinidadians and Jamaicans and Barbados. You'd be surprised. So I had those people in my congregation, so I really did have an international church. They were all black people, but they, every culture different. Mm -hmm. So yes, that was one of the things that I had, had in our church. And it took me a few years to really realize that I was not just preaching to black people, that I was preaching to black people who had various cultures. I had Haitians mm -hmm. that came up, up onto something else and different. And most of them, the Haitians I had in my church, were they came out of the Catholic. So outside of their own personal culture, mm -hmm. religiously, there was a problem. But boy, if you want to see a little church that, that just seemed to have everything just clicking together, it was 105. We called it 105. And um, God was, and when I saw that, that was one of the reasons I wanted to see us come together as a group, because I knew it was, you could do it, it could be done. Even though it was done in a small measure in the church that I pastored, I felt that we could do it in a bigger measure in the state. But then let me move one a little further in as much as it was still in New York. Um, some amazing things have happened to me as a young man. I was ordained, as I told you, in the church in 70, in 72, I think. Um, but I was never, ever, uh, never served in the state council in New York. New York did have a um, black representation there. In fact, it was one of the states that seemingly first moved into that area with the state councils. But uh, surprisingly, and against the, the uh, I would think, against what the minute book and what our principles are, we had men serving in New York City on the state council who were exhorters mm -hmm. that, could, that I knew, but they were white who couldn't really read a good scripture, but was placed on the state council when Goodwin Smith was never, ever even mentioned. And again, it's because somewhere along the line, um, my whole character and, and um, uh, whatever people thought of me had been tarnished. Mm -hmm. Well, you, you were a very um, straightforward, forthright man. You have strong opinions. You have obvious leadership ability. And it's possible that some people could not really uh, handle that. They didn't know how, what to do with it. But now, then you've mentioned the various blacks. And that, that would be like uh, all the different mix of whites that would come together. And we certainly are not of the same cultures. Right. Uh, the Russian, the Hungarian, the uh, whatever they may be, the Italians, and so on. But what about now the Latin Americans? The, and at this time, New York is beginning to have a lot of difficulty between the blacks and the, uh, and the Hispanics. Mm -hmm. Did you see any of that while you were in New York? Not when I was there. Um, I, I knew there was a division in the church, and that was, uh, I think that was expected. I mean, in the sense that um, I could not speak Spanish, and, and, and many of them couldn't speak English. So I knew that they had to have their own um, and, and I'm for that. I, I, I concur with all of that. Having their own superintendent, having their own, they had their own churches, and they had their own convention. I can understand that. 
Um, but I never felt any there was any friction between, let's say, blacks and the Hispanics. Um, even uh, I know later years it, it really got kind of bad because they, I mean, they did simple things like start throwing rocks and things at each other. You know, I mean, you just had those uh, type of uprisings in New York City where the Hispanics and blacks were at war mm. with each other, even some killings for that matter. That's outside of church. But um, I did not <coughs> encounter too many, too, any problems with the Hispanics. I've never had any problems with the Hispanics. Mm -hmm. um, I recognize the fact that they were, they had their own uh, unique um, culture. And their own unique problems, problems. Yes. that they're facing yes. now. I'm sure they probably face the similar thing that we face. Very, right. very much so. Yeah. And it is just a, it's just a more difficult situation for us to try to get a handle on mm -hmm. uh, when we're handling that kind of uh, disparity between cultures and, and races and possibilities. Now then, you want to get back to uh, I've detained you from doing that. Back to Bermuda. So let's let's get you back to Bermuda now because there's where it's clear to me that God must have really been grooming you for your work that you would do there because of the, the work that has been done in Bermuda under your leadership. We we went back to Bermuda in '74 from the assembly, and um, we took over the headquarters church and oversee of the island. At that time, we had about three churches that were just about operating. Um, from the headquarters point of view, meaning overseer point of view, there was absolutely nothing happening. Um, and the overseer, pre the, the overseer just before me was my pastor. Um, but there was nothing done. The church that I took over um, financially was in a very bad state. In fact, when they asked me to go back to Bermuda, um, I was going back to Bermuda and asking me if I would come and do secular work. I told him, the kid, I'll stay in New York and fight all the frustrations I have. I'm not coming back to secular work. Um, as you may not know, and maybe you do, that the overseer in Bermuda receives absolutely nothing from Cleveland, Tennessee mm -hmm. or from the mission department. So we're not, I'm not salaried from this department. So um, there was no way for me even to make a salary that way. What we did do uh, we went back and looked at what was there and decided that we would work with. I always like a challenge. I've always been, mm -hmm. God has sort of given me, I think, a little added strength to deal with challenges. And when I saw it, we decided what we needed to do. And with that, we did turn the church around and um, we um, got the church in a real good stead. We got it spiritually, it needed to be. That's number one. And I had to work with that. But Dr. Conway talked about 1974, and um, in four years we started to get the thing really rolling. We hadn't yet gone in any physical plant building, no building. We had no buildings of our own. The headquarter church had, did not own its own building. We were in the theater renting. Um, we had two, two churches that were our own. That, that was all we had and my congregation, which was renting. So I felt like we need to get our own building. And there were a lot of areas I wanted to stretch out a little bit in the island, of Bermuda being like it is, you can't go too far for planting churches. Um, and so there was a real challenge. And, and you hear folks saying, well, you know, a former pastor couldn't do you. What are you going to try to do? Well, we, 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 we set out. We set out to do all that we thought was necessary to do. But lo comes 1978, and the building burns down to the ground, the one that I'm pastoring. The theater building. The theater building burns down to the ground. And it happens on a Saturday night. So I got church service tomorrow morning. And um, I had immediately get on the news media uh, by way of television and radio to inform, well I had then contacted the, the, the secretary of the city and asked him if we could use city hall for church service. And without any problem they, they allowed us. So I had to get that message over to the people, and God, God just did it. That Sunday morning, I had more people in my service than I would have had if we had the other <laughs> building. I mean, folks just came. People came from other churches. I think they knew what had gone down. Our church had burned, burned down. That was the news mm -hmm. in Bermuda for a week or so. Um, and I think they probably wanted to know how we were going to respond. Well, it was a very sad service. It was, it was like a funeral. Um, I preached the whole sermon crying. Um, uh, my counsel were crying, my ministers were weeping, and we had no building. We were like a family that's just, we didn't have anything. Um, and we had no money. 
So we were in a real bad state all the way around. Um, but you know, the city responded and let us use the city hall. And we, we moved church from the city hall theater to the city hall exhibition hall. So we had to move from the downstairs to the top floor. We had to move organs. We had to move, move drums and these things. But in the process, uh, God blessed the church because feminists came in. In fact, the assistant to me on my console, if I'm not there, he chairs the, uh, his family came in during that period of time. Feminists came in and joined the church and things turned around. We had meetings, we moved from City Hall and we couldn't have it because they had their own thing program. We would put the tent, we put a tent up on a field, we had a church there for a week or two. Then the wind came one time, blew the tent, put holes in it, knocked the thing down. <laughs> I started questioning while I was in God's wheel. I'm coming from New York, all the problems I had up there. I, you know, I got to a point with Dr. Khan, wonder if I should even serve God. You know, it sort of gets to the point. I knew I should serve him, but it just got questions started to come up. Why are all of these things happening? And um, then we moved from there to a school room, and my congregation moved until our theme song, every service, and it was a blessing to us, come to the church in the wild wood. Mm. We sang that Sunday <laughs> after Sunday <laughs> after Sunday. And until finally we were able to to purchase some, some property, which we are now, where we are now, located. We purchased the, the property. Now that was right downtown. That's right in town, right. right across the street from where we burnt down. Is that right? Right. The, where we burnt down in one corner over here and we bought over here. Diagonally. Across. Yes. Mm -hmm. uh, we have a choice piece of property right now. Uh, we have on that uh, property um, a building that houses a hall. Um, it houses upstairs our Sunday school uh, department um, has three offices, mine, my secretary's, my wife who runs our school. We have a daycare center going with 130 odd kids. Um, the finances that it brings in has allowed us to do things that we want to do. Um, the finances of the church has just grown tremendously. The church membership has grown. We're sitting in that building alone, around us 1 million point eight. We, don't, we came to Cleveland and, and we, um, I guess, laid on the table of the mission department our plight in Bermuda, the church being burnt down, we uh, homeless. But we went immediately into a, a building program. We wanted to get things going. So the mission department, along with the general church, uh, granted us uh, some money to get us started. Now that impressed the, the banks in Bermuda that our headquarters in Cleveland would do that, and we're talking at the tune of some $80,000, that they would do that, which made then it easier for us to borrow money from the bank. And um, so with that, we went on and we built what we have there now, which is about a million point eight. Um, we today owe absolutely nothing on it. The other two properties in Bermuda are debt free. And then since that time, I've been able to set in order three other congregations. So right now in Bermuda, we do have five, six churches. We have five churches and one mission, and the mission is going to be set in order very soon. All of the buildings are owned by us, with the exception of the two. That's the one in Somerset and uh, the little mission. And so we, we now own our own properties there. And the we are in the process of building our sanctuary, which will seat about 1,100. It's going to cost us somewhere now in the region of two and a half million dollars to, to build. We've been blessed of God to raise over a million dollars ourselves toward that. And so uh, financially, uh, right now where we are in Bermuda, um, church-wise and build, building-wise, we're in a very good position to negotiate with the bank. Mm -hmm. The bank will, will hear will hear us out. Our credibility in Bermuda is 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 just about tops in Bermuda when it comes to Christian I, organizations. I certainly found that out yeah. in my visits to uh, the Bermuda. banks will the banks will tell you and they've told others that um, they feel that if there's if there's an organization in Bermuda that that um, really knows what they're doing is the New Testament Church of God. I mean as simple little things like making um, deposits to the bank from our various churches. I've had to sit down with our leaders and tell them what to do and how to do it. Uh, our church gets high marks, and I've received personal letters from management of the banks that if every institution in Bermuda did it like New Testament, 
how it makes would make everybody's job easier. Um, we get calls from the bank right now. If people will go to the bank, the bank has gotten to the point with us is that if anyone comes and want a recommendation, they would send them over to me first. And if we give a recommendation, the bank will consider them loans. Mm -hmm. So the credibility of the Church of God in Bermuda is a one. And incidentally, and I may be able to share it with you later today, just out of this 45th General Assembly, uh, Island Convention, we have just uh, come together some resolutions that we've uh, put forward to the government. I was on television in Bermuda last night and radio yesterday morning. So on my way to the airport, I stopped by and, and they did a um, uh, um, thing on me on what the 45th Convention of the Church of God presented. The, the news media is latched onto it because we're talking about abortion, we're talking about lotteries, we're talking about AIDS, we're talking about the black um, uh, role model in the island is, is, is at an all-time low. And we dealt with the thing. So I called my secretary just before I left the hotel to come here. And she said, the front page this morning is dealing with the Church of God and its resolutions. And so we constantly put the Church of God in Bermuda, the Church of God is known. Mm -hmm. uh, every overseer, I'm talking about general overseer, the superintendent, Brother Summers, is known in Bermuda uh, because we, in all of our ads, we put a picture of them there. And other churches have since which followed. But the Church of God is well on the, on the uh, map in Bermuda, well known and well respected. Now along with that, because it, it takes me into other areas and things that I wanted to do in Bermuda, to do in the Church of God, I mean throughout the world, not only Bermuda. Through our involvement, I serve in Bermuda on a, on a juvenile and domestic court panel. We hear cases of little kids, their children that have gotten themselves in trouble. We have to send them to what we call approved societies, um, any homes that has been approved by government. We take them from the parents sometimes and send them in these places for a year or two. We have um, adoptions. I sit on, on uh, granting adoptions. I sit with a magistrate and with another panel member. I serve on, I've served on the, and I'm only telling you this, basically because of what it has done for the Church of God. Sister Smith and I on protocol at Government House, if there's any function, we're there. And we're right up in line with the Catholics and the Anglicans who are very high, yes. in, 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 especially in a British colony. But the Church of God's right there with them. I yes. mean, they ain't no step ahead of them. We're right there. Um, I serve also on, I served on the drug abuse board for many years um, that would give to the government and we, we, we're sort of a, a board that sits down and goes through all the, do all the hard work for government and then make recommendations. I've served on that. I serve now on the Human Rights Board of Inquiry that if anyone has any, if it's racial, if it's, if it's uh, sexual, um, sex, I'm sorry, um, um, discrimination, any type of discrimination, we sit in this board, it's brought to us and we deal with the cases. And we've been instrumental in some decisions that's made there. Mm -hmm. So uh, the Church of God has been um, placed in a, in a very high um, position in Bermuda uh, in so much that even the Queen of England knows about us worldwide now. Uh, uh, because of our involvement, uh, we receive from the Queen of England, an MBE, and that's a member of the British Empire. Now, let, let me uh, stop you enough to clarify. You're talking about a personal honor that came to you because of your leadership in Bermuda. I want that to be clearly mm -hmm. uh, understood on the record that, uh, that you have gained that kind of respect and that kind of uh, attention from the empire itself and not just on the island of Bermuda. Right. Now go ahead and explain and, and, and I just want to add to that also that I've always given credit that I would have never been, probably would have been in politics, but I don't think that the honor that was bestowed upon me by the Queen because of my involvement in the community would have never come about had I not been a part of this church. Mm -hmm. I honestly believe that. The so Church of God gave you, definitely yes. gave you a voice That's and gave it. you a, and, a and, vehicle. And, and because of that, I, I believe that wisely we've used it. And um, to God's honor, one of our lady pastors received a certificate of honor from the Queen um, about 
four years before me, one of my pastors. So what is her so, name? Uh, pastor Dorothy Tuzo. She is my only lady pastor. She's still there. Still there. She was doing a fine job. Yes. And um, she received uh, that distinction from the Queen, which we deemed, I mean, that was high. And then when mm -hmm. this came, it, it was a step higher. Um, that's all come because of our involvement in the church. Mm -hmm. That's first and foremost. When we went to England to receive it, um, I, my wife and I stayed with the superintendent of the Church of God. I mean, everything we do is Church of God. I don't go to visit. Uh -huh. I go to Florida and visit. We go to Church of God. We don't go to the Baptist. We, we go to Church of God. Sure. I'm Church of God. So with that, we went to England, and the superintendent went with us, and uh, Brother Doug Leroy. He was in the palace with us. He went right in and sat with my wife when I received from the Queen personally. And I just think I sh should make mention of this, that when, I, in fact, I was the only black recipient of any honor that year, and when I stood before her, she questioned me, not so much about, she did ask my involvement um, to get the honor, but what she was concerned about was the church that I worked with. Um, I said, I am the Church of God. I didn't say anything about New Testament. I said, the Church of God with headquarters in Cleveland, Tennessee. And they said, oh, I've heard about them. And I said, we have hundreds of churches right here in England, you know, in London and throughout. And um, she gave me more time than I saw, and I was, because I've been an S. Smith, my initials mm -hmm. were there. So I didn't see her stop. I, didn't, I didn't really didn't see her stop anyone as long as she, she yes. stayed with me. And I was able to, to um, testify to her a little bit. And so I deemed that an honor that God gave me an opportunity to stand before royalty and talk about him. But I've also put the Church of God there, and that's where I got it from. So she asked me about the church. She asked me about the function of the church, how, you know, how does the church government. And I was able to tell her about, we have a, a general overseer and a first, second, third mm -hmm. assistant and makes up the executive committee. And I talked about the, the council and I told her that I served on the council. And um, she, th she said, this is amazing. You know, and so she was, she was thrilled with what she was certainly we were probing in her questions. Yes, uh, that's right. We need to know more. Yes. I, also wore, <laughs> I also wore my collar, my clergy collar. Um, I did that for a couple of reasons. One is that she could identify with that and all the Eng Englishmen could, opposed to me going in a, in a tie and a shirt, that I'm a businessman. And um, so that took her off from the beginning. In fact, that got her started, I think, because she thought that I was linked up with the Anglican Church because yes. I had the collar. Yeah, yeah. And so then we moved into that. Yeah. But um, getting back to Bermuda is that uh, right now, the church is, is, is on a tremendous move uh, spiritually. God, we've had some of the some of our uh, top general officials in the Church of God to come to Bermuda. Um, uh, we've had about three and maybe even four general overseers when they were in office. We've had uh, general overseers that were not in office been to Bermuda, and Dr. Kanye, one of them. And um, I must also say this, that um, most of my teaching and a lot of my reading has come from the books that you've written, and I've been impressed by it. I stood in the pulpit just this last week, and I've been promoting uh, because our people have a tendency, if you're not careful to stick with them, they buy uh, uh, Hagen's material yeah. and they buy all. I said, we've got writers in the Church of God. I went down the line and I said, we've got the cons, we've got the reusers, and I went down the line, who the writers are in the Church of God. And, and I just did this last week. Uh, and I did this because, and I'm not, I'm not trying to flatter anyone, not, I, I right. did it because that's where I am. That's where I read. Right. So most of my teachings that I've done in Bermuda has come from your many of your writings. And I just well, that, that's a compliment. I thought I would object that. that. Brother uh, Smith, while uh, we're here, I would like to mention to you that I really considered it an honor and a privilege to uh, serve with you for four years on the Executive Council. That was from 19, oh, what, whatever we are, 1988 to 19... No, 1986 to 1990. Yes, that's it. And that we were able to serve together. And I was very uh, aware of the contribution you made to the council. You were certainly not a quiet member. You were not uh, intimidated in any way. And that is to your credit, to the credit of your mother and father who raised you to uh, be bold and assertive. But d in those years, you and Wallace Sibley were the two who were black 
on this uh, council. Did you encounter any kind of opportunities or discouragements or what was, what was it like to be there knowing that it was not the norm of past history at least? First, let me tell you, I, I've served on the World Mission Board for eight years and that was a breakthrough. Um, I guess I, I, being the first black to serve on the World Mission Board for eight years and um, my eyes had been open to a lot of things there. But because it's World Missions and I'm a part of World Missions, I think there were a lot of things that I could relate to. So coming to answer your question, to come on the council now, which was basically Americanized. Um, even the things that were discussed in the council were, were basically American. Uh, yes. American. Um, those were some of the things that baffled me. And um, uh, they were things that did not directly concern me. Yet it seemed like the mission department was doing, was doing the part that the general church should be doing. And it just seems like we got things a little mixed up there. Mm. Um, the mission department is doing the worldwide thing because the mission department was also dealing with things in America. When I went up to the, when I went and sat on the... Oh, that, that's an interesting insight. Yeah. When I sat on the executive, then I was sitting, basically to me was almost like sitting, and I'm not trying to belittle it, God forbid, but it was almost like sitting, I would think, if I, and I never sat on a state council, but it would be almost like a state council. Mm -hmm. Opposed sitting on the World Mission Board, I felt like this is the church because we had our hands on Europe, we had our hands on the Caribbean, we had our hands on, on North America, I, we, I mean we had our hands on the, on the world, we the, had the, the Far world. East, yeah. We were dealing with all of these areas and, and like I say even America. Mm -hmm. To the extent because when we were talking about the type of where our money come from, it was here. So we had to deal with the things here also and, and dealing with having your know, mission reps and it was Americanized. So the things that were coming across the board in the World Mission Department was the type of thing that I felt very comfortable with. So when I went to the Executive Council, let me say this, that I, I respected, I honored the privilege to even serve on it. Um, but I was a bit taken back with the fact that we were dealing with a lot of little things. Domestic things. That could be dealt on a state level. And when you try to deal, or even when you start to talk about things that concern the general church, I was, was getting some vibes that some of the members on that committee, were on the, I'm sorry, council, were not too pleased about dealing with it. And we were talking, I'm basically talking about internationalization. I think that's one of the first areas. Once we did what we did, which I thought it was very brave of the church, and, 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 and I, I, um, I take my head off to the church, for doing that, at least putting two members from outside the U.S. on the council, enlarging the council, and doing what they did, then I thought that we would have dealt more in depth with the internationalization of it, uh, talking about um, uh, having a worldwide general assembly, these areas that we have, we, it's being mm. talked about here and there, but I thought that that's what this Supreme Council, if you want to call it, but at least the Executive Council would have been dealing with. So when I came there, I was vocal on the areas that I was, I knew that I could have some input that concerned me and concerned the Church of God worldwide. When it came to the American problems, um, they were almost immaterial to me as an individual. But sure. I sat back and listened to some of the arguments. But now, uh, Brother Smith, you have um, touched upon something that is very, very vital to the Church of God for its future. And I'm glad that uh, you have um, drawn this into sharp focus because it needs to be there. I had never uh, perceived in, in the way that you have stated it that the highest body other than uh, the General Assembly itself, um, the Executive Council, is more domestic than one of the boards That's that right. serves under it. Yes. In other words, that the council should be dealing with a greater 
a global perspective than it does instead of a narrower perspective. That's, that's a very interesting insight, and I appreciate your... And I'd like to say that. this also because there has been some misunderstanding, and it has come about because I think we put ourselves in a position, is that the World Missions Director has more power than the General Overseer. That has been resented by General Overseers, but I think the church has put itself in that, mm -hmm. in that place. Mm -hmm. and, and I can't see why it can't be changed. There has to be some way that mm -hmm. that could be changed, and we become what we say we are. I served on the committee when we talked about um, internationalization, and one of the things that was brought up in our committee meeting was, um, let's change the name, let's change the sign down in front of the building, let's put instead of Church of God General Officers, Church of God International Officers. I said, fine, and I laughed at it, I said, I'm for it, any type of change, for it. But that ain't it, that's not it. Mm. You know, folk are not fooled by just driving by and seeing a name change. What else goes with it? And so, it has always, in fact, Brother Khan, I say this to you very sincerely, that I felt much comfortable in doing more for God in the World Missions Board than I did in the Executive Council. Mm. That's amazing. And I was more... And because you were elected to the... Yes, one was an elected, one was an appointment. Yeah. Right. And, and, and I hope that this is not misunderstood because, you know, I, I, no, I, no. I use a shoot from the hip, I say it the way well, I well, see no, it. No, it's enlightening. Um, the, the, the thing is, I was hurt more coming off the World Missions Board, knowing they had to come off after eight years, than coming off the Council. And, um, and I'm not no way sitting here before you or whoever will listen to what I'm having to say today trying to belittle, degrade the Executive Council no, of the Church. I think no. it's, it's there to serve in its purpose or a purpose. Brother, Brother okay. Smith, uh, a number of years ago, 1955 precisely, I was overseas and I happened to be with the executive director uh, world mission, of World Missions and with uh, the general overseer. I was not the general overseer at that time. But nevertheless, I'm in their company. And that is exactly what I observed at that time, that people would, trying to explain the function of the two men, would say, well, the general overseer is over the Church of God in America. Yes. And the uh, director of world missions is over the church in all the rest of yes. the world. Right. You know? So and the disparity of that came through, and we discussed it. Mm -hmm. But uh, to realize that it is that uh, easily perceived in other parts of the world is most interesting. When you, and when you look at your numbers in the Church of God, and we're talking about somewhere close to three million, I suppose, our membership has gotten to now, um, um, two-thirds of that is outside of the U.S. Outside the U.S. Okay, so when you, who's your big man outside of the U.S.? And you cannot help it, it's going to be your mission director. Yes. He's the man that the people know. Okay, take for instance now your general overseer. Where, where do you see at a big camp meeting in Bermuda, big camp meeting in Jamaica, big camp meeting in Europe, wherever, that your general overseer is there? No, you got your mission representative and he may send somebody for him. But yet in the States, your general overseer will sit on the platform and he will go to camp meetings. So the camp meetings in the States mean more to the general overseer's office position than it does uh -huh. mean outside of U.S. where you've got two-thirds of your membership. I just think that the church is lopsided in where it is. But they won't listen to Goodwin Smith. I mean, I can, mm -hmm. I, I, they're not going to listen to me because uh, I'm probably coming from a different area. Um, I'm just saying that this is a, and what I've done in Bermuda, the general overseer may never come to Bermuda, but my people know who he is. They know who he is basically because I put in his picture in the paper, so they know him by picture. So Brother Crowder's picture just ran out of the paper and I bought him Brother Vest's picture. So my people, I've even got people in the community say, I see you got a change of leader. Mm -hmm. They didn't worry about the name, they just saw the picture. I'm talking about people in the secular part of the island who have said to me, I see you got a change. So they know that the Church of God has changed and I do it by picture because I pictures because I try to bring my people up to where the church is. They, my people also travel to the assembly. So they know what's going down. People like yourself who has been to Bermuda, the Church of God 
and I'm sure that many of them spoke to you about it, they've read this Dr. Khan's books and his material because I promote it. But to meet the man, boy, that's, that's mm. mine, you know, immersed mm. into those people. So when you come to a general overseer who is general overseer of three million people worldwide and you never see him mm -hmm. because he's really a stateside overseer, that's the way we perceive yeah, it. And, and, and they <laughs> localize it in that way. Yeah. Brother That's Smith, right. you've always been a delightful uh, conversationalist, and I've always enjoyed your uh, very wise insights into the work of the church, the work of Thank the you. Lord, and into personal life. It's been a real delight to have you with me here uh, for this visit. I've been talking to Dr. Goodwin Smith, who is the overseer of the Church of God in Bermuda, who is a highly honored and respected a uh, citizen of that colony and of the empire and of the Church of God. Brother Smith, thank you very thank much. Thank you, for Dr. Kahn. My pleasure. Thank you.